pattern. I couldn't make head or tail of it. Uh, so today I'm just going to try and redeem myself and share a Latin word with you. Uh, decem. I think it's decem. Which is actually the uh, Latin for 10. The number 10. The number 10 is very interesting because uh, I, I remember the time the currency changed in Ireland from sterling, uh, you know, 12 shillings, one pound and all that, to the decimal currency. And it caused a lot of uh, hair pulling and trying to figure out uh, the 10 as opposed to the 12. But the decim comes from the Romans. And there is another big word that I'd like to share today to show off how smart I am. Uh, and it's, it's, it's called decimation. Uh, you, sometimes in a football game, uh, Mayo maybe, uh, <laughs> someone says, oh, they were decimated, right? They didn't play their game, so they were decimated. But the, the word decimation actually means to remove a tenth, decim, to remove a tenth from it. And that, that, is, that comes from the Roman army. The Roman army were the, the greatest army in the history of armies. The empire was the greatest also. Uh, but, and, so, and the reason they were so successful is because they were highly organized. They didn't have satellites and GPS like they have today and cell phones. So you, to win a battle, you had to move your force quickly from A to B to C, wherever the weakest point was, advance, etc., etc. So you'd have groups of soldiers that would move all together at the same time and do what it was supposed to do. The barbarians were kind of all over the shop, like the Mayo boys, you know, throwing stones and <laughs> running off, you know. Um, but, but so... And the Roman army, the, 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 the soldiers in the Roman army were, uh, they were more terrified of their uh, commanders than they were, they were of the worst barbarians. And they met some pretty rough barbarians in what is now Germany back in the days. But they were, they were more terrified of their own boss, their captain or whoever. Uh, and it's because of this thing called decimation. So in a, in a group of 10 soldiers, they were divided into units of 10, and if one of them didn't do his job right, if he turned coward in the middle of battle or some other thing, they'd take the troop of 10 men, they would cast lots, and whoever pulled the short straw, the other nine beat him to death. So it may not be the guy that was the culprit gets beaten to death. That's how harsh, so, you know, at that time, you wouldn't want your child to go into the army. Uh, but, so, one out of the ten, if he pulled the short straw, and he didn't do anything wrong, he was beat to death by his friends. Imagine that on the bus going home from uh, Medjugorje, if there's 40 people in it, divided by four, and uh, one or two people spilled coffee, then the rest of us beat you all up, right? <laughs> So one of the pro proofs of resurrection to me, one of them, I, I don't need proofs, but I, one, to me one of them is the guards, the Roman guards seemingly fell asleep. It was the easiest job a Roman soldier could have to do. Just to stand there. There's a seal on the tomb. It's a big, a big ugly rock. Nobody's going to move that. The Jews aren't going to come because they've already proven themselves to be cowards. So there's no earthly reason why there should be any problem. But should it go wrong, those guys are going to end up with, uh, having a really bad day. So to me, something supernatural happened with those soldiers that was bigger than themselves. It's a message to me that when God acts, he can overcome the most powerful army in the world. And so the, the, the story, this story of resurrection, which we've gone through this week, and Father Leon mentioned it yesterday, how sad it is when Catholics who, who go from A to B, from Sunday to Sunday, don't bother with the story that takes place of the Tridium, the three days, the most powerful story ever, the most, about the most powerful thing you and I could be doing at any given time, which is quite simply this, what we're doing right now. Taking part, celebrating, participating in, consuming, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he became that through his passion. It's very earthly. It's earthy. It's got, it's got flesh. It's got blood. It's got rocks. It's got stone. It's got soldiers. And so as 2,000 years later, we are carrying out rituals that Christ himself told us to do. So I'm doing with my hands, with my voice, in my vestment, with this altar, bread and wine. 
We didn't change that. It's not changeable. It's always been there. Christ gave it, and we do it. So every time the ritual takes place, something supernatural has taken place. We don't see it necessarily with our naked eyes, but there's something by, by virtue of our faith and the power of the Holy Spirit that tells us this is the living Christ. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There's no question in my mind about that. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Not so fast sometimes, but it gets me out. <laughs> So the power, that, the power that's unleashed here, right here in this chapel, at this sacrifice of the Mass, it's drawing from the original of Christ being crucified. Do this in memory of me was using the Jewish sense of memory, which is when we remember something now liturgically, we're actually going back to the original event. So we're bridging the gap of time between the original event and today. But it's the same reality, that this is the power of the Mass. It's the power of the Mass. So it's not, this is not just stuck in Medjugorje time. This is bigger than Medjugorje time. It's bigger than the walls of this building. It's bigger than your own personal family history. And I always tell people to pray for their history, their family tree. But so the, the ritual and the acts, by using your body, by using your voice, you are, if you're like, you're turning on the tap. It's like turning a tap. There's a tap there. I need to turn it on. And the water which came from the clouds, which landed in the reservoir, which came through the pipes, comes all the way to your home through a tap, but you've got to turn the tap on. So liturgically, we're turning the tap on, if you like. You may say, well, where are we going with all this, Father? I, I want to read a little bit of scripture from the prophet Ezekiel, because that prophecy of Ezekiel, one of the prophecies of Ezekiel was given to the parish priest here before the apparition started happening. And it was by Sister Breach McKenna, and she saw that the church, she described it, but she also saw, got the reading about the, the water flowing out, as Ezekiel described it, north, south, east, and west, from the, from the altar. And that's literally what happens. The grace is flowing from the altar. It's doing it globally. North, south, east, and west means global. Medjugorje is global. How many nationalities have we here? But it's flowing from the temple, and it's coming because of the action. The stone, the flesh, the whips, the blood, everything to do, the bread, the wine. So that is, that, is, that is, if you like, opening up the heavens and grace is being poured out. But I want to read this to you. It's Ezekiel 8. He next took me... Now, this is where Ezekiel was being shown the sins of Israel, the sins of the people. The prophets were sent to announce, or to, if you like, to announce the spiritual temperature of the nation. And the Hebrew peoples were known for their infidelity. They were given the revelation, and guess what? They complained, they wandered off, they ended up worshiping false gods. So anyway, this is what Ezekiel said. He took me to the entrance of the north gate of the temple of Yahweh, where women were sitting weeping for Tammuz, which would be a false god. He led me to the inner court of the temple of Yahweh, and there at the entrance of the sanctuary of Yahweh, between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs to the sanctuary of Yahweh. These were men who were supposed to be facing the sanctuary. These were holy men who were supposed to face the sanctuary, like the priest, the priesthood, like all of you. Adoration, mass, altar. We're facing Yahweh. That's what we're doing. They, but the, the, the uh, yes, there we go. Between the boards and the altar, there were about 25 men with their backs to the sanctuary of Yahweh, and their faces turned to the east. They were bowing to the east towards the sun. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see that? Is it not bad enough for the house of Judah to do these filthy things that they're doing here? Now, I could go on with the rest of this reading. In another, in another translation, it says abomination. So if Yahweh uses the word abomination, you should, you should pick up your ears and say, well, what is he talking about? Because let's face it, I don't want to have anything to do with that, right? But the bowing to the sun is, is a spiritual root to something else. Just as Abraham is a spiritual root to the, the Passover. It's all there in a line in scripture, but there is an original root. Bowing to the east and worshipping the, the, to the sun is carried out by Hindus and Buddhists. It's actually the root, the spiritual root of yoga. It's the spiritual use, root of yoga. Asanas and positions that are used in order to... And by the way, yoga is never for, for exercise. It's got nothing to do 
with fitness or exercise. It's original intent. If you go back to the original authors, it's for union with Brahman, union with God, union with pagan deities. That's the whole purpose of it. Out of, out of mind, uh, alter consciousness, and it ends up in possession, the worst cases. And you ask an exorcist about this, you can Google it. But there are spiritual rules to yoga that most people are not told about. They do it because it's supposed to make you fit or healthy and all the different other positives that are put out there. But the fact is, there is an actual spiritual root that Ezekiel is talking about here. This is actually a condemnation of it. Bowing to east and worshipping the sun. Google it if you doubt me. And Yahweh says, he describes it as an abomination. You've turned your back to Yahweh and you're facing to paganism and pagan idols. So the idea that it's for fun or fitness, that doesn't fly with God. When you go before Jesus for your final judgment, and he says, look what you were doing here. And you say to him, well, I only did it for fun. Well, tell that to Jesus on the crucifix. That's the price he paid to liberate you, to get out of Satan's garbage, get out of his allurements and his temptations, and he tempts us with just about everything. Reiki. Reiki is demonism. Witchcraft is part of our entertainment. And I could go on and on and on. And if you doubt what I'm saying, buy yourself a book called uh, Jesus Christ, the Bearer of Water of Life. It's a Vatican document, and it lists all the New Age stuff that a lot of people never hear about. They said, I didn't know there was anything wrong with the Father. Everybody's doing it. Well, everybody's doing it. It will not fly on your judgment day. It will not fly. The only thing, the, the, the cross of Christ is what divides you from the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And they are, there's only two options at the end of your life. One is hell and the other is heaven, because Jesus said it. He died on the cross, he was flayed, the blood, every last drop of blood. And that's what the Romans did. The, the type of torture that they gave him was to extract every last drop of blood out of him so that he would suffer the most. It was the last outburst of Satan. He tried it with Peter. Don't go to Jerusalem, Lord. You shall, in other words, you shall not become the sacrificial lamb. You shall not become the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hang out with us here for a bit longer. We'll have more people coming out of the tombs. That was a very good idea. If I was there with Peter, I'd say, good man, Pete. But Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan, because Satan knew that if Jesus kept going, he, it was going to be the end of him. And when he knew it was going to be the end of him, he unleashed every amount of fury against Jesus. The last drop of his blood, his last breath. And in his last breath, what did he say? It is accomplished. Now, any, any half-baked genius uh, looking at Jesus nailed to the cross would say, what did you accomplish? There's nothing accomplished there. All your boys, your helpers are gone. Bar John. Your whole ministry is gone. The whole thing is gone. What's accomplished about that? What was accomplished was the sacrifice of the Mass, the new, the, the new Passover has now been finally established with his last breath on the cross. And that is what divides the kingdom of darkness from the kingdom of light. And a lot of people are going into the kingdom of darkness slowly, gradually for entertainment and other reasons. And they don't even realize it half the time. But they're still going that direction. All new age healing is taboo. And if you've been to that, and tarot cards, and angel cards, and fortune tellers, and all that stuff, you need to confess it, you need to renounce it. You can't have your feet on both sides of the fence. Decide today. This is like a valley here in Medjugorje, there's mountains around us. This is the valley of decision. This is where you decide for Christ, you decide for the light, or you decide to keep going the way you were. I'm not giving up my yoga. I spent too much on it. Well, good for you. But that's not going to get you into heaven. And you have to make a decision. You decide for Christ or you don't decide for Christ. But there is only two decisions, yes and no. There is no maybe. There is no maybe. There is no middle ground. Purgatory is purely a purification for any sins that we didn't deal with in this life. So purgatory isn't a third compartment. There's only two. And St. Faustine in her diary, which is well worth investing in, she was given a, a vision of hell 
And when, when, when she was given the hell, vision of hell, taken there by her guardian angel, she saw heaven and she saw purgatory as well. But when they were revealed to her, she said, one of the things she noticed about hell was most of the people there were people who didn't even believe it existed. They didn't believe it. There are a lot of people going around today who don't believe it. They don't think there's a consequence to sin. They think there's no consequence to killing babies. They think there's no consequence to legalizing the killing of them. There may be Catholics here in this church this morning who actually voted for this. You were duped. And if you did vote for it, you need to repent of it. That's how radical this story is. This is not a nice dressed up holiday with some spiritual trimmings added onto it. This is a point of, of conversion. It's a place of conversion. It's a place of decision. And I can't explain to you or describe to you the infinite love that Jesus has flowing out from this altar for you. But it also depends on you turning back to Jesus. People presume the mercy of God. They say, oh, it's your God will take care of us anyway, you know. You don't get the mercy without the, the repentance. This is why Medjugorje is so important. Knock also. The confession is a hugely important part of this. Confession. And some people say, well, I don't need to go to confession. All right, here's another one. I, I'm not Catholic, I'm not Christian, but I'm very spiritual. I'm spiritual. Yeah, well, guess who else was spiritual? Satan. Satan was spiritual too. So I am spiritual, excluding Christ and the sacraments. Forget about it. So you have to make a decision today, wherever, whatever point uh, you are on this scale from unholiness to piety, you have to make a decision. I'm going towards the piety. I'm getting on this train to heaven. And the argument that some people say, well, the, the, the Reiki master healed me. He, he may heal you for a bit, but I can tell you one thing. Satan will cash in his chips eventually. Because Reiki is demonic. It's the work of demons, and it may be your aunt or your uncle or your next door neighbor that's practicing it and getting a few bob for it, but they're channeling demons. That's what they're doing. And interestingly enough, it also involves rites and rituals and laying on of hands, a mockery of what Jesus does, a mockery of what Jesus told his disciples to go out and do with all authority. And people are succumbing to this left, right, and center primarily because they haven't heard it before. And, and, and we as shepherds, have a lot on our hands if we don't announce the first commandment to people and all the ramifications of not knowing and our teaching the first commandment. Playing uh, tarot cards and all that, it comes, the, the, the ban on that comes before the ban on murder in the, in, the, in the catechism. Why is that? Because when you break the first commandment, you're willingly opening yourself up to the demonic. And it can come through supposed healing techniques or, or words, or, or, or projections about the future, our health, or maybe my body is going to be a bit more limber if I do this. Well, Jesus himself said about the body, and we know from the body of Jesus on the cross, the redemption of your body is number one priority with Jesus. It's redemption of your soul. He says it's better to go to heaven with one eye missing than go down below with two perfect eyes. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So he, it's not primarily about redemption of the body. It's about redemption of the soul. So if you're doing some bodily thing that's somehow indirectly caught up in some alternative religion or something else, you need to get some other form of exercise. And meditation is another one. Buddhism, mindfulness, Oprah Winfrey, all the stuff that she's peddling, all the other... I can't forget the other guy's name. There's a whole gang of them. And they all, they've all got the answer to your problems. And guess what? They're all making money while they're, sh while they're spreading their lies. They're all getting rich out of your misery. Telling you that there is no supernatural God. That Jesus isn't important. It's all about you. Centering yourself. Meditation. All this stuff. That's the biggest lie of Satan ever. And he tailors his temptation to suit your interest. If you're an artist, he'll tempt you with art. If you're a musician, he'll tempt you with music. If you're trying to get fit, he'll tempt you with fitness routine that's, that's essentially spiritual behind the scenes. And when you buy into all those lies, you might, you're, you're basically, when you break, start breaking the first commandment, all you're doing is you're taking out your baptismal cert and you're shredding it and you're putting it in the shredder and you say, I can do this myself. It's all about me, my energy. 
Well, it's not about your energy. There's only two ways. There's only one way of redemption. Jesus said there's a narrow door. The world tells us today, the world, the salvation, do what you want. It's your body. Once they want to give you a jab, then it's no longer your body. <laughs> it, don't politicians interest you? So we're receiving the body and blood of Christ. It's, it's not a joke. And, and the price that he paid to that, I wouldn't even go next night near the Garden of Gethsemane in an armored jeep. I don't have it in me to go to, even to do that much. So when we look at the cross of Christ, and every house should have a crucifix in your home. You should actually wear one while you're at it. But that, when you look at that, you're looking at your salvation. You're looking at the key to the door of the kingdom of heaven. And I can tell you, there's somebody who doesn't want you to use that key. There's somebody who doesn't want you to get through that doorway. And you're going to have to make radical changes if you're caught up in any of this stuff. You're going to have to say no to it. You're going to have to renounce it. You're going to have to confess it. And if you don't want to, then please don't come near me for confession. Please, don't waste my time. Time is too valuable. Souls are too valuable. If you're not willing to change, don't come to me for an argument. I'm telling you the teaching of the church because I'm quoting that, that, that article or th that document from the church. Jesus Christ, the bearer of water of life. He's the bearer of the water, which is the Holy Spirit, which flows out from this altar freely. He's paid the price, but you don't get it for just sitting around. And you're certainly not going to wallow or waltz into heaven with your hands in your pockets. Casually. That's the price that's paid to get you into heaven. So you've got to respond to it. And when people do respond to it, and when people go to confession, I had a woman come to me many years ago for, for confession. She, she was probably 70. And she had done something quite serious way back in her teenage years. And she it was burdening her all that 70 years, or however long she was, since the time she did it to the time she came. In the sacrament of confession, she became a new woman. She cried, she became a new woman. That's the resurrection. That's the power of the sacrament. But you have to be willing to let go of your sin. Don't be holding back, because if you hold back, it's ineffective. So this is all a wonderful promise of Christ, but it's also a, a sober challenge to us to see, well, where am I going? What is my ultimate? What is my highest value in life? Is it more property, more cars, the Celtic tiger, any of these things? It's my body. What is it? My fitness? Is that what it is? The only, thing, the only posture for your body that's, well, that's worth doing. And unfortunately, in Ezekiel, the boys who were doing it in, prostrating before the sun, they were actually in the wrong direction. So we can go to the Blessed Sacrament. We can come to the altar. We can go to confession. That's why Our Lady has brought you here. And she brought you here today, whoever is in this room, to hear this message that I'm giving to you. Because it's not my message. It's not my little hobby horse. I'm telling you the teaching of the church. I'm telling you the teaching of Moses. And Jesus always referred back to Moses because Moses was prophesying Jesus. So don't argue with me and say, oh, Father, you're a bit hard and heavy in this area. That, I'm just quoting scripture. So if it's, if it's, if it's bugging you, it's not God's fault. If it's making you mad right now, what I'm saying, or irritated, that's not my fault, and it's not the fault of Jesus. It's coming from somewhere else. So we might stand and profess our faith together. And it, one of the uh, sentiments I have about the creed is it's a great way to make the devil mad. Because the contents are, he tries to live out and work the opposite in our lives than what we are actually professing as a body here today.